Uh, good afternoon, good evening. I think five o'clock is that transition <coughs> moment. I think we're uh, about ready to go. My team will take care of admitting those other people as they come along. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, my name is Patrick Lawrence and I'm the CEO <coughs> of First Step. Uh, at First Step, along with the rest of the alcohol and other drug sector and the mental health sector, we are above all else in the welcoming business. And in that spirit, I give you all a warm, compassionate, unconditional and heartfelt welcome. You are in the right place, regardless of how you came to be here. And we're going to take good care of you. I'm sorry that we couldn't uh, feed you and water you uh, tonight. That was the plan um, for our event hosted by Monash University in the city. But we're improvising and uh, it's going to be it's going to be fantastic it really is a privilege to have this particular group of people here tonight we've got people with a lived experience of addiction and of mental ill health and indeed their family members also uh, from philanthropy and from the business sector we've got friends and supporters of community organizations like first step uh, we've got state politicians uh, parliamentarians, advisors, friends from the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, we've got First Step staff and board members and volunteers. Hi, guys. Uh, we've got senior staff from sister organisations, including Peak Bodies, uh, in the health sector and in other sectors. We've got community advocates. And of course, we've got our esteemed speakers tonight, Dr. Nicole Lee, Professor Patrick McGurry, and Dr. Nico Clark, ably assisted uh, by Ian Gray and Simon McKeon. I thank you also very much for being here tonight. Uh, our goal really is for a, a friendly and a casual event. So like you're doing, please do leave the cameras on if you feel comfortable. Though note, the event is being recorded and in a day or two, we'll send everyone the links and this will be going out on the usual socials so that as many people as possible can benefit from the rich conversation that we plan to have tonight. Leave your um, microphones on mute until we have that conversation and question time a little bit later on. Hands up if it's not your first video conference today. Yeah. Hands up if you're maybe verging a little bit on the exhausted from this strange kind of life that we're living at the moment. I know I am. Uh, however, the need to engage and support vulnerable Victorians does not go away. Quite the contrary, it is relentless and it is currently exacerbated. But another thing that is current is the extremely rare opportunity for genuine reform. And it'll be over before we know it. <coughs> the Royal Commission into Victoria's Mental Health System has provided some really profound insights and some guidance about uh, what is required for the mental health sector to save lives, to minimise suffering and to provide well-founded hope. But what about the alcohol and other drug sector? Now, we know that both mental ill health and addiction can happen to absolutely anyone. But what remains or questions remain unanswered about who's disproportionately affected or who's disproportionately neglected by the current system? What other crucial questions do we need to ask as we're going through this reform period? How should alcohol and other drug and mental health sectors interact or integrate? There's that word. How should each of us invest our time, our energy and our funds into compassionate, welcoming, life-affirming and life-saving reform? They're big questions and we're going to have a look at some of them tonight. And that's just about enough from me. I'd like to introduce a friend of First Step, Simon McKeon. You can see him smiling away there. Um, I do this with a very big smile on my face. He is the Chancellor of Monash University. Um, at different times in his life, he's been the Chair of the Melbourne Office of Macquarie Bank, AMP, CSIRO, MIOB. He's the Chair of the Greater South East Melbourne uh, of Greater South East Melbourne. It sounds a little bit like El Presidente. That, that, that's a new one to me. Um, and he was the one-time chair of the federal government's panel reviewing health and medical research. He's one of our former Australians of the year on the group tonight. I hand you over to the uh, very capable hands of Simon McKeon. 
Thanks very much, um, Patrick. And uh, before I do anything more, I want to acknowledge country and um, let us take a moment to recognise the various traditional lands on which we meet today. I acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Bunurong or the Boonurong peoples of the Kulin Nation. And I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you are all gathered. I recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land, which continues to be important to First Nations people living today. And I also pay my respects to elders past and present and extend all of our respects to our First Nations people who may be with us today. Um, I take great pleasure in um, following up Patrick's sentiments. I welcome Mark Watt, the chair of the, uh, the Board of First Step and your fellow board members in particular, I highlight, I welcome Angela Wilton, a board member, uh, because along with Angela and Monash University, they were supposed to be, um, uh, I guess, putting on today's event uh, with refreshments and what have you. I hope you've organized your own refreshments at home. But Angela, thank you for uh, stepping forward. And uh, perhaps Patrick, we can do something similar again in the new year in a real place. We'd love that. Um, one of the um, uh, surprises I guess we get from having to, I hate the, I hate the word pivot, but nonetheless having to change at short notice um, in response to the continued lockdown, is of course the opportunity to welcome members from um, interstate. So it's great to have a handful of people that have crossed um, the, uh, the border today uh, without having to quarantine, which is good, and to join uh, today's um, Zoom. Um, but in particular, I do wanna welcome everyone who has come. Uh, Patrick, you've described the places that we come from, but it's a, a wonderful opportunity to have um, you know, the, the mosaic of the community which must respond to the urgent issues that we're going to talk about today. Um, Patrick, I think I first met you probably in the year or so after First Step was, um, was established, uh, probably almost 20 years ago. And I remember at that time when I was running the Macquarie office here in, um, in Melbourne, um, I can't recall the actual issue, but there was a bit of a grumble going on in the office. And it caused me at one point to, to say to two or three individuals involved, grow up or, you know, behave better. It was about that time, and I can't recall exactly why, that I was introduced to you and in particular, your vision of boring people like me taking off, we used to wear ties back in those days, taking off our ties and having a go at mentoring people who are doing it tough, your clients at St Kilda. The reason I mentioned the grumbling going on in the office before, and I thought a need for people to grow up, was that I've always been someone who says the for purpose sector isn't only for the benefit of, in the case of First Step, those addicted um, to various substances. No, it ought to be of great importance to all who choose to have an involvement, whether it's those that commit their lives like Patrick to working in the sector, those who commit financial resources, those who volunteer, there must be something positive that we get out of it. And it occurred to me at that time because Patrick's vision was not only to find some people to mentor and help people coming out of an addictive position um, but, but I just saw an opportunity with, um, with Patrick's vision to actually educate, train, because the idea, what, what Patrick was proposing, that we would actually, before we got near anyone uh, to, to mentor, that we had to undergo some serious training. And so I got my fellow colleagues to come along. And all I can say is after several evenings of um, not only understanding the work that we had to do, but actually being given... Um, some excellent training as to how to respond um, that my vision of everyone ought to benefit from this was absolutely vindicated. Indeed, the, the, um, the talk around the office, the grumbling that had gone on previously started to disappear. Eyes were opened, 
leads were seen and most importantly sleeves rolled up and um and we got stuck into something that was immensely valuable for us it's a long time ago now patrick and 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 i'm not someone who has been on the board of first step or taken a huge involvement in what you've done but it's just been wonderful seeing two decades go by and literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people um you know positively impacted so well done Today, um, we're going to have a number of panelists who will speak and I'll hand over to Ian Gray in just a moment to introduce them and run proceedings. But the only thing I want to say before I shut up is that as a species, I think we're finding it harder and harder to simply communicate and make progress on tough issues. Some put it down to social media. I, I, I think that's a bit of it, but at the end of the day, we're starting to lose a certain element of tolerance. We're not as good a, a listening community as perhaps we were once upon a time. And it's exacerbated when you come across a really tough topic like this one. Addiction is ugly. It takes its toll of those addicted. But of course, because of the outworkings of what they end up doing, it takes a, a huge toll also on their families, the wider community. There is real damage that is done. And I am not surprised that very passionate voices come out and respond to the obvious need to do something about it. I'm also not surprised that we end up having big arguments about it. The, the hope today is that we can have um, not only some great speaking, but some very, very good listening, some great ideas. Patrick continues his crusade of reform. It's hard enough just simply dealing with the desperate need that comes to first step week in, week out. But the bigger challenge, of course, is at another level to make changes, reform, if you like, to a system so that less people get into that position in the first place. And of course, the assistance that can be provided today is more effective in any event. So today is uh, an opportunity to ask those tough questions to have our disagreements, but most importantly, hopefully to learn from um, the views of others and, um, and of course, help a community that desperately needs it. Can I therefore welcome retired judge Ian Gray, who's a former chief magistrate, county court judge and state coroner. Early in his career, Ian worked in private practice as a solicitor with the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service and as a barrister specialising in criminal defence work. In 1987, he moved to the Northern Territory, initially working as principal legal advisor for the Northern Land Council in Darwin, and then as a magistrate until he was appointed chief magistrate of the Northern Territory. And then as chief magistrate of Victoria, Ian implemented a number of major reforms, including the establishment of the Family Violence Court, the Koori Court, and of immense relevance today, the drug court. Ian has had a long standing connection with Timor-Leste, having worked there for the UN in 2000 and continued the relationship through Victoria University where he is an adjunct professor. He was awarded an order for Australia this year for services to the law and indigenous justice. And Ian, we're in your hands for the next hour or so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. And uh, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you, Patrick. And uh, let's uh, let's go into the main body of the program now. We've got three speakers, as you know. We've got Patrick McGarry, Nicole Clark, and Nicole Lee. And it's my job to moderate the uh, undoubtedly uh, sensible discussion we're going to have together. And hopefully, it'll pr be providing a lot of ideas. And uh, as Patrick suggested, and uh, I think Simon did too, some some controversy because there are some issues that are controversial and I'm not as familiar with them anywhere near it as most of you are, but they clearly are in this uh, area. So we begin with Patrick McGorry and I'm just looking across the screens and yes, I see you now, Patrick. Uh, right there, hi. Uh, and all of you know Patrick, he's a well-known, well, well known, worldwide psychiatrist for his uh, development uh, of the area of early intervention, youth mental health services, uh, mental health innovation, advocacy, reform, uh, a prodigious um, amount of work uh, Patrick has done, as we know so well. Formerly, he's 
Professor these days of youth mental health at the University of Melbourne and Executive Director at Origin. Uh, he led the advocacy which resulted in the establishment by the Australian Government in 2005 of the National Youth Mental Health Foundation, which in 2006 became, as many of you would know, Headspace, and he remains a founding board member of Headspace. He's played a key advocacy and advisory role to government and health system reform in Australia and in many other parts of the world and most recently chaired the Expert Advisory Committee of the Royal Commission into Victoria's Mental Health System. And that's a, a recent major landmark event that we'll hear no doubt a fair bit about tonight. And uh, with that uh, introduction to Patrick, I'm gonna pose a few uh, propositions and questions to set the scene for him. Uh, he's gonna speak about the social determinants that lead to addiction, but I'm sure it'll be a wide, uh, and intriguing. Uh, so I'm going to ask Pat a few questions. Uh, is there a group or cohort that is experiencing uh, distress in relation to mental health and addiction that is not being met? An unmet group, a missing link, if you like, uh, not being met by the current service system? Is there a service gap, to use that language? What do we know about this cohort? Uh, what do you think, Pat, is the key during this reform period to address that kind of shortcoming or that particular shortcoming uh, and might strategies positively impact the overall system namely strategies that are directed to meeting that service gap if you like uh, what might they be used for in a broader sense other than just for that specific focus so with that uh, pat it's over to you to uh, talk about the social determinants that lead to addiction thanks yeah, thank you, Ian, and uh, hello, everyone. And uh, what a pleasure it is to be invited to be part of this this, this great uh, discussion with with um, an amazing group of people. Just looking at the the screen here, and thank you to Patrick. Um, I might just start off on a personal note. I, when I first met Patrick, and I saw what he had actually set up in in a fairly sort of um, what's the word grassroots way uh, at first step, it embodied a lot of the principles that we have been fighting for. You know, in mental health care. For some time and i think the, the most important one is integration and this is where the controversy is likely to unfold as we talk about this because um but anyway um I, i'm going to talk about maybe the social determinants but um but, but i think I'd, I'd really also like to sort of talk about in a personal way about why addiction is is very important to me um and why we we are doing such a poor job with it at the moment um and um and also with the benefit of you know, my, my uh, sort of longevity, I suppose you could say in the system, like I've been working in public mental health care for about 40 years. And, um, and I've seen, you know, uh, where we, uh, us move from, an, from a, an incredibly neglected, but still pretty integrated system where mental health care and, and addictions were fully integrated to a very dispersed and fragmented and underfunded sort of system, particularly on the addiction side. So, so we've gone backwards actually um, on that front. Um, in many ways. And that's why I suppose the Royal Commission threw up all of these kind of failures, these terrible public policy failures, especially over the last 20 years or so. And um, so, but this is, it's a very optimistic time. We've got a chance. I see Catherine Wetton here, who's in charge of the reform really. Um, now, um, we've got a chance to fix these things and, and we, we should be guided by what's right and what's, ev what's evidence-based, not what, not what suits particular you know, groups or, or, or vested interests. So hopefully we can get to that sort of uh, sharp end of the, of the discussion at some point. <clears throat> but I'll speak personally, first of all, I lost my brother at age 37 to alcohol uh, addiction. Um, and he died of liver failure at the age of 37, was completely let down by every aspect of the system. And at the age of 37 was denied really even physical health care, which could have been life-saving. So, so I think, um, Obviously, that's a, a very personal note. Um, many families have had that experience or similar experiences. And obviously, even more families have probably had the same experience with mental health care. So to me, it's very personal um, and, um, and, I, and I'm very committed to it. And um, <clears throat> I also might say on a personal note, I was trained at a time when we were fully trained as, as trainees, as, a, as psychiatrists in training in, in alcohol and drugs and addictions. And it was, I spent nine months uh, in, that, in that area of, of higher you know, specialist training, as well as training in psychiatry and mental health. So it was fully integrated in those days. That, those days are gone. 
um, and and there are you have to create artificial sort of structures like addiction psychiatry and addiction medicine to kind of bring that back together. So I'm sure I see Dan Lubbins on the call. And I'm sure he could talk uh, very nicely about that issue too. So integration is what is what I believe in, and 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 all the evidence, all the evidence in the literature, in the scientific and and even the health services literature supports the idea of a full integration of mental health and drug and alcohol. But we've actually developed, as, as Patrick alluded to at the beginning, separate systems of care. And we talk about the drug and alcohol sector and the mental health sector as though they're different. Well, they are different things because the, the, the funding and, and uh, I suppose commissioning models have actually pushed them apart over the last um, 20 or 30 years to the great uh, detriment of, of the patients and, and the people who suffer from these problems. And, and um, I will touch on social determinants in, in one way, in that the social determinants of both mental illness and drug and alcohol uh, problems are overlapping to a very, very high degree. So the causes are very similar, whether they're genetic or, or um, social, environmental or, or, or personal and, and psychological, very, very similar uh, and overlapping. And, and, and the effects are overlapping incredibly as well, because the comorbidities are, are ubiquitous. And you know, one of the things that I've done over the last um, 20 years or so is, is work to establish in the primary care sector um, a youth-friendly sort of a, a first step, I could say, in terms of um, uh, uh, youth, youth mental health and youth, youth, uh, youth health. As I just uh, attended a book launch uh, yet, um, yesterday. I don't know if you can see this book on the screen there. can't see my own uh, image here, but can you see that? It's um, probably not. It, it's... Um, it's, it's, it's written by Kerry Gibson, and it says it's entitled What Young People Want from Mental Health Services. And I can assure you they don't want fragmented mental health, they don't want fragmented services. And this is one of the principles that established Headspace. That you, it was a one-stop shop, like First Step. You go to one location and you get most of your common needs met in the one place by a range of different professionals. And they don't all have to be health professionals. Some of them can be educational experts. Some of them can be employment experts, that's one of the pillars of Headspace. And, and one of the four pillars of Headspace is, is drug and alcohol expertise. And we don't send it down to another agency down the road. We, we, do, we, we provide it within the primary care setting um, alongside the mental health professionals, alongside the GPs, alongside the, if, if, um, if, there's, if there are legal professionals there too, they're there too. So it's a fully integrated holistic service, which is needs-based. And, and that is an antidote to there's sort of people falling between the tracks and not actually being able to access care in, in, a, in a kind of a consistent way. And the important thing there is, and we haven't fully achieved this, is to put all of those resources and professionals under the same governance. You know, having people seconded in from different agencies, we find is much less effective than having them employed under the same um, lead agency and governance. So, and I think that's similar to what First Step has, 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 has uh, developed too for a different population. That's very easy to achieve in primary care because you don't have the vested interests and the turf issues arising you know, in the same way as you do once you get into the more specialized sector. And I think what, what I've seen anyway, and obviously this could be debated, I see some other people on the, on the call, we may, may not agree with this, but we've seen a, a defunding uh, and, and, a, and a privatization really of drug and alcohol service over the last 20 or 30 years. And we, and we see a massive fragmentation so, so in which it's, you've got a whole array of NGOs providing the services instead of more consistent, you know, um, integrated sort of a model of care. And it's very, it's got different professional standards, it's got different types of people working in it, and very few addiction specialists, which, which I think Dan once told me there are only a handful of addiction specialists in Victoria, which is a little bit different from other states, actually. So there's been like a deprofessionalization of, of, of the field. And this, this is a highly lethal area. People die of, of addictions that, and, and they get a whole range of mental health and physical harms from them. And yet, you know, it's, it's being managed in this sort of way. So I think massive reform is needed in that sector, a massive upgrading of funding and expertise, integration with the rest of mental health care. And, and that's, that's a challenge for reform. I tried to put that position within the Royal Commission um, I'm not sure why it didn't get up. There were all, all sorts of forces operating within the Royal Commission. And, and um, I think we did get it up and accepted much more strongly in the youth area, partly because Headspace had already demonstrated the value of it. But 
but um, it was more challenging the adult set in the adult area. And I, and I understand there's a discussion paper now put out from the department under Catherine, which is looking at how you might actually get better co-working or better collaboration or better working together. But that's really not, in my opinion, and I'm obviously happy to have a respectful debate about this. Um, uh, I don't think that's really going to hit the spot. It's not going to meet the needs of the people that, that uh, depend on this, on this uh, much higher level of integration. So um, I haven't got time to go into all the evidence in support of what I'm saying today, but I can assure you in the scientific literature, it's very strong in support of what, of what I'm saying here. Um, there are differences you know, and, and, and there are purer forms of addiction or, and, and mental illness. I mean, not everyone with a mental illness has a drug and alcohol problem. Um, but the vast majority of people with addictions do have mental health issues. Um, so I think if we don't integrate, we will sell them short. We, we, will, um, we won't have the same degree of scientific rigor that we've actually got in, in, within psychiatric and, and uh, medical research. And addictions have really been, if, if mental health is the poor cousin, um, I would say addictions are the impoverished cousin when it comes to you know, the, the care system and, and also the, 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 the medical research support even though it's a massive public health issue, that the amount of medical research going into addictions is very, very limited in this country. And, and uh, so for all those reasons, I think integration is, is absolutely the, the holy grail. We've been talking about it for 30 years, ever since I came to Victoria in the mid eighties, it's been talked about and, and you have integration within the bureaucracy at times, but you never have integration in the real world in the, in, in the same way that it's really needed. Um, uh, and uh, so I think, I feel quite passionately about this, and um, I'm very up, happy to, to, to debate it with some of, some of um, my colleagues here tonight. Um, but um, yeah, so that's mainly what I wanted to say, um, and, uh, and I'd love to hear what other people have got to say about this issue. Okay, <clears throat> well, thank you, Patrick. That's a, that's a great start, and uh, that's a, it's a powerful argument, uh, and I know that we can have the argument tonight, or at least the debate about that. Uh, because it's not uh, the the views are not all one way. Although it might very much come down to what words mean and what integration really means, and what the holistic uh, uh, means if it's to be compared, if it should be with integration. Do you see the two in a, really effectively for the purpose of this debate side by side? Yeah, and, and we're going to do integration that. Integration and holistic approaches. We are, we're going to actually be able to do it at Origin. We will have the opportunity, you know, within the new reformed um, world, which is fantastic, by the way. I think we're living in the best state of Victoria right now to, to actually make things an awful lot better. Um, uh, we will be able to do that at Origin, but I'm just worried we won't be able to do it in, in the rest of the, of the system uh, unless, unless there's a change of thinking somewhere. And is there any sign that there's going, I mean, there's the Royal Commission and of course, in all of its conclusions and recommendations, is there any sign that you want to mention and others may speak about this later from, from a policy point of view or a government point of view, is there a sign, uh, a hopeful sign on this as you see it? Um, well, look, I'm sure it'll get better, but it probably will be sold short, I think, because the Royal Commission is basically, um, don't want to be flippant here, but it's a bit like the Koran now. Um, it, the department has been given the Holy Commission, uh, sorry, the, the Royal Commission's uh, report, and, and, and it's having been involved with it, I think it's the best thing I've ever seen in mental health reform as, as a blueprint. But, you know, there, there are ways it could be improved still, and this is one of them, I think. And I'm just, I'm hopeful that we can revisit that, this particular issue of integration of drug and alcohol and, and mental, mental health care. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, Pat, thank you very much. And uh, we'll move on now to uh, our next panellist uh, this evening, uh, Nico Clark. And Nico is uh, here. And I think he is, uh, I can't immediately see Nico. There he is. Hi, Nico. Um, and uh, Nico is, uh, many of you will know, the Associate Professor uh, Medical and medical director of the medically supervised injecting room and the AOD program at North Richmond Community Health, uh, an extremely important uh, entity and institution with, a, with an extremely interesting recent history. Uh, he's an addiction medicine physician by training. He's head of the addiction medicine service at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and chair of the Victorian and Tasmanian branch of the chapter of addiction medicine 
with the College of Physicians. His most recent role was clinical director of drug and alcohol services in South Australia before he took up the role that he has now. He's an experienced clinical researcher focusing on treatment of opioid and alcohol dependence. And when based in South Australia, was head of the WHO Collaborating Centre on Research into Drug and Alcohol Problems. He also has experience in epidemiology and public health and has worked in a variety of settings from remote indigenous communities uh, to the World Health Organization in Geneva. So with that um, introduction, uh, Nico, uh, the, the uh, topic uh, that uh, you're gonna speak to us about tonight is what are people's, uh, uh, who, are, who are the people that experience addiction? And you've got this unique uh, perspective on this and experience and day-to-day -day experience of it. Before you start, uh, Nico, I'll just uh, put this uh, question, um, a fairly simple one, really. In your work at North Richmond or, or elsewhere, uh, what do you see as the key factors uh, in people's lives that uh, drive them to inject drugs? Bearing those factors in mind, how do we move forward dealing with them, uh, assisting people, uh, treating people? Uh, how do we move forward with the, the, the necessary compassion and dignity and get the kinds of clinical and personal improvement results that people might seek. So that's the, uh, that's the question uh, for you, uh, Nico, and uh, the uh, formal topic we gave you was who are the people that experience addiction? Over to you. Thanks, Ian. And can you remind me how long you'd like me to Yeah, you've got, um, you've or... got uh, uh, I think, um, let's just have a look, oh, 10 minutes. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, first of all, uh, you know, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk to this group today. It's fantastic to have the opportunity to talk to, to so many people who've got real insight and influence in this sector. Uh, I'd like to also acknowledge the, the, that I'm coming to you from the Wurundjeri, land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay respects to their elders past and present. The, the um, Indigenous community is such a, a large part of the, those who are present at the injecting room in, in Richmond, and um, and I think it's you know it's good to keep in, keep that in mind that they're, they're highly overrepresented in the people who are who are using that centre. About fifteen percent of the people visiting that centre have a, an Indigenous background. So, um, who are, who are the people who have become addicted? Look. Look, all of us can become addicted. I mean, addiction is a mechanism that's in a, that that all of our brains have. It's the way that we learn something, and that we learn how to automate it. I mean, and if we don't automate things, we you know we can't walk, we can't you know do many of the bodily functions that we need. It's the way that we kind of you know, develop repeated uh, behaviors into into patterns in our brain like you know neuron pathways in our brain that become automatic for us so what addiction is it like it's a totally no, it's a totally ubiquitous thing that all of us have but um, most of us don't become addicted to substances because when we take those substances they don't really fill a void in our in our in our in our sense that, that we want to kind of repeat them and then we start repeating those behaviors um, and if I, you know, if I look perhaps at the most addicted, the most severely addicted in our in our society, who are the ones who are using the injecting room, who who even uh, even four heroin users are the most marginalised of heroin users, according to the Burnett uh, cohort study that they do. What we see is that they they have very specific experience, life experience, um, that is very different from the rest of us, and. Um, I, the, the group that we see, by the time that we see them, they're, they're typically uh, older. They're, they're, the average age is 40, they've been, but they've been using heroin since they were teenagers, since they were high school age. You know, the majority, in fact, didn't finish high school. But we realised that you know, things started, their, their life experience kind of started differing from kind of the, uh, the average life experience very early on, in fact, while people were either in primary school or secondary school or even earlier. And uh, the, uh, you know, one of the people in the injecting room uh, start, left home at the age of, of six because of what was happening in a home environment and, was take, uh, and started using heroin from the age of six. So we really... Um, we're really looking at issues that happen fairly early on for people, and they're typically 
childhood neglect and abuse. Uh, and there's extremely high rates of, uh, of physical and sexual abuse in this population. And um, we know that, to, um, uh, that, you know, that, that it's, not, but, you know, it's not a rare event in our society, but the, the nature of the abuse that happens in the, in the population that we see is really horrific. It, and, and certainly the most extreme that I've seen in my 25 years working with this population. And you know the typical, um, uh, you know, we have uh, on any given day. There's typically one somebody will come to us, and in, in our we've got a little clinic on the in the injecting room for people who want to happy to receive kind of uh, some support of one kind or other, another. And people will say to us, oh, "Look, I've had enough. I've been using heroin for 25 years. I've had enough. Can you help me?" And then, and then when we kind of talk to them about how they got in that situation and kind of plan what's what's the best way for them out of it. They invariably tell us about uh, you know, the horrific things that happened to them in their childhood. And, and I think really as a society, we've, we, we've uh, failed to prevent those things happening. We failed to pick them up earlier. We failed to support people when they were younger. And then we've repeatedly re-traumatized them when they start using substance abuse, when they start deviating from how we expect people to behave, instead of saying, "Well, what's happened here? How did you know? How did you get in this situation?" We're very quick to punish people for kind of deviating from the path, from for using illicit drugs, for you know not doing what we're expecting them to do. We then put them through very punitive um, responses of one kind or another, which then just re-traumatize people and kind of cement this fact that they're that there's no hope for integration with them with the rest of the society and they see themselves very much in opposition to the rest of society they feel that there's no place for them in society and they then become further and further marginalized homeless very high rates of homelessness in our community and then they end up in an injecting room 25 years later and i think there's a lot we can learn about the way that our society and doesn't look after people for whom horrible things happen when they're young from the people who are attending the injecting room in Richmond. When, what they tell us uh, is that they have a, you know, who are they? They have a whole range of problems. They have physical health problems. They, they have uh, hepatitis. Most of, most of the group have had hepatitis. 91% in fact have had hepatitis from sharing bloodborne viruses. And, and a significant number, a quarter, probably have active hepatitis needing treatment. They have incredibly poor oral health. They, the majority of people have got constant pain in their mouths. Uh, they're missing teeth. They need teeth removed. They get that kind of scrunched up look in their mouths, which says to people that, you know, there's something wrong with you and they can't smile. They can't, and there's no, no prospect of kind of getting a job or anything like that if you can't smile at people and show your teeth. They have they they experience very severe health problems. They end up in hospital with infectious diseases or uh, you know blood clots. Um, they have high rates of cancer, and of course they have high rates of mental illness also, as was pointed out by Pat. But um, they don't want uh, well. What they do want is they want they want exactly want a one stop shop. They want to be able to receive care. Uh, they also, much to our surprise, that many, many of them want help stopping their substance use. And uh, when we organised um, a consultation with uh, the people who are using drugs in Richmond prior to opening the injecting room, they, 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 one of the main things they said was they want a one-stop shop. They don't want to go around all these different services. And so that's what we have really organised there. We've organised where people can come in and get their hepatitis treated within 90 minutes. They can, they can start their opiate dependence and they, in treatment and they typically have injections which will kind of block heroin for a month. And that's the most popular treatment in the injecting room. Um, and, we've, and they have oral health care again on the spot with silver fluoride initially followed by a kind of removal of teeth and, and dentures. And but when it comes to their mental health, they, they have high rates of kind of what you might call the kind of residual effects of early childhood trauma and mental health problems. There's a degree of psychosis, but that's not the major thing. They, they have a kind of combinations of anxiety and, 
difficulties in trusting people and relating to people that you might call a personality disorder, you might call elements of post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. And, and uh, they just, they affect their capacity to do those ordinary life things which are necessary for kind of getting on with life and, and kind of feeling good in a normal way. But they don't want to be referred to the mental health system. They don't see that the mental health system has anything for them really. Um, and because the mental health and, and, and often the mental health system, if I can be quite frank, is, is also traumatizing for them. They've had traumatic experiences in engaging with the mental health treatment system as they've had traumatic experiences engaging with the physical healthcare system. When they go to hospital, they're, they're not they're denied opioids when they're opioid dependent instead of being given opioids so that they don't go into opioid withdrawal. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, I would say we certainly, uh, we've had fantastic results with a one-stop shop approach, integrated care on site. Um, and we have an addiction psychiatrist who's working with us. We have kind of mental health trained nurses who can, who uh, and social workers who are able to kind of deal, help support them with their mental health issues. But often it's at a kind of very basic problem solving level because that's all people are up for at that particular point in time. And then later on down the track, we can look at kind of the kind of more sophisticated uh, uh, ways of dealing with kind of trauma and other kind of psychological assistance. So that's what, what, what I think we need in our healthcare system for, for people is, is not only an integrated care, but a kind of trauma informed care because the people who use these healthcare services as a result of their early life life traumas, they, 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 they're not always able to meet our expectations. It's a simple thing like attending an appointment. Uh, appointments are difficult for people if they're not able to plan their lives carefully. And then if they're punished for, for not being there on time or if they miss something or if they then then they feel that kind of sets the whole treatment process back and and so often the way that we design our treatment systems don't take that into consideration the treatment of hepatitis has got about 10 different steps the majority of which involve an appointment of one kind or another but it doesn't they don't need to we can in fact do it in 90 minutes on the one spot um, and, and again, so in, uh, in our treatment of uh, the kind of mental illness, we also need to kind of think about how we can do that in a way which takes into account their past trauma. So with my hat as a kind of chair of the addiction medicine doctors in Victoria, I would agree with many of the things that um, Pat has said. Um, although I'd point out that I would completely agree that the addiction treatment service is, e is even less well-funded than mental health. It's, it's I think about 10% of the mental health budget is spent on addiction. When the burden of disease, if you if you consider the kind of addiction, that addiction is also a risk factor for other diseases, is fairly comparable to mental health. And so we, you know, we really are completely underfunding. And, um, but merging into one system has not necessarily been the best outcome because of the different nature of psychosis treatment. Psychosis, the, 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 the drama involved with treating psychosis tends to overwhelm a, an underfunded healthcare system because uh, uh, dealing with psychosis is, is fundamentally a different kind of response than dealing with addictions. Often with psychosis, uh, for a portion of that, you really need a kind of coercive treatment model, whereas in dealings with addiction, we have a really collaborative treatment model. And, and uh, often the two cultures, uh, if you take a, the culture of a service which is used to coercing people, it, 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 it's difficult for the staff to kind of switch their mindset to the kind of collaborative care that's needed in addiction. So it could be that we can provide more mental health care in addiction and more substance use care in the mental health care sector, and they could well be under the one governance structure. But I wouldn't, I'd say that we don't, we're not necessarily going to benefit our clients if we put them under the one treatment system. And maybe I'll leave it there. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Nico. Uh, there's a lot to think about in what you've been telling us. And uh, there's a, a telling and uh, poignant. Uh, point about uh, people not being able to smile and of course we know what you mean exactly when you say that about people to have the significant 
dental and other oral problems uh, fueled by their addiction and, and fueled by their their drug taking and as a real uh, well poignancy is the word that comes to mind about uh, that aspect of of uh, their lives well look what we'll do now is we'll move straight to um, nicole lee and that'll leave us enough time for plenty of questions to when nicole finishes and i think uh, again uh, nicole is going to be familiar to many of you uh, she's here and i just want to make sure i can pick her up on the screen uh, nicole where are you um, there you are top run <laughs> hello again El nicole uh, uh, welcome again she's the founder and ceo of 3 360 edge a specialist at AOD consultancy and she's also adjunct professor at the National Drug Research Institute at Curtin University. She's a board member of Hello Sunday Morning and The Loop Australia. She's worked in the sector for more than 30 years. She's published in the sector. I've read some of what she's written. Uh, she's a researcher. She's an educator. She's well known for her experience in all things, apparently all things uh, methamphetamine uh, and in best practice AOD treatment in general. So she has immense experience uh, uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you this evening, Nicole, and over to you. And we've given you a topic um, uh, which we've, we've named how much, uh, how much Should We Care is the topic. Um, and we've heard from Pat and we've heard from Nico about service gaps and we've heard now uh, quite a bit the, the ground laid out about the, the uh, tension, for want of a better word, between um, uh, one-stop shop uh, and integration. There's a question about, about whether this is more about words than about uh, uh, about actual systems and service delivery, and we can talk more about that. We're all here because, of course, everybody here really does care. That's why we're here. That's what this is about. That's the founding philosophical premise that Patrick uh, uh, put uh, as a foundation to this. And it's a question of what is, is, what is done in the best ways for all of the people that uh, we're all seeking to assist. So I'm going to ask you, but Nicola, how optimistic can we be in Victoria that the Royal Commission and subsequent reform will lead to the changes uh, we need to see uh, for the people that you all care and the sector cares so much about? Uh, what does the evidence say we should be doing to ensure these reforms are going to be a game changer? That's really a question ultimately, I think, for everybody to hear this evening. So, Nicole, uh, uh, your topic then is, uh, to use the expression, uh, how much should we care? That's a somewhat rhetorical sounding question, but it's a very important question. It's ultimately the critical question, uh, probably. How much should we and do we care? Over to you. Thanks, Ian. Um, look, I, obviously we should care a lot, but um, I think the question is how do we, how do we show that care? Um, I just acknowledge that I'm on Bunrung land um, first. Mm. And um, just say so that I'm probably going to answer that question in a slightly roundabout way. Um, I kind of feel like maybe it's a brave person that contradicts Pat McGorry. So I'm just going to be a little bit brave today, but I do agree with much of your thinking, Pat. And um, I think a lot of the difference is in terminology and it's a little bit in how you see the solution. And so I just want to um, talk a little bit um, more broadly, be kind of bigger picture to shift the perspective a little bit and just look at it from a different, slightly different angle. Um, first, I'll just say I, I've worked in both sectors and I think that this commitment to um, adopt all 65 recommendations from the Royal Commission, um, if it goes ahead, is by far the biggest reform that I've seen in my 30 year professional lifetime. So um, in terms of game changing, it's absolutely a game changer if we can get it right. I think the very first thing we need to remember and be really clear about is that alcohol and drugs and mental health problems are not the same thing. Um, there is a tendency to kind of think that uh, alcohol and drug um, problems are just some kind of subset of a mental health disorder. And the Royal Commission was specifically set up to find out why the mental health system was failing to support the people who needed it and to make recommendations about how to fix it. And some of those people do include um, those with both alcohol and drug and mental health problems that coexist. Um, it did consider the responses to co-occurring mental health and alcohol and drug use, but because it was a mental health royal commission and not an alcohol and drug royal commission, 
um, it was kind of looking at that issue through a mental health lens. And it was specifically looking at what mental health needed to improve those responses. So kind of to misquote Einstein a little bit, um, your perception is based on your frame of reference. So wherever you're standing, you get a slightly different picture of the problem and what the solution is. And um, it really is the, the bane of the alcohol and drug sector's life that um, the mental health perspective is constantly being overlaid onto it without much kind of thought about the specific needs of the alcohol and drug sector. So what the, what the Royal Commission recommended was that the new mental health and wellbeing hubs um, should integrate treatment, care and support of alcohol and drug problems as core business for those new services and for the re reinvigorated services. So the focus is on how mental health services can improve their capability to respond to alcohol and drug problems. So if we agree that alcohol and drugs is not just another type of a mental health disorder, then um, within mental health, then our, the alcohol and drug um, use or alcohol and drug problems then become one of a number of other needs to be addressed by mental health services through this more wellbeing focus. And, and that's holistic care. So the Royal Commission was relatively silent about the issue from the alcohol and drug perspective, but importantly, it did specifically recommend that the alcohol and other drug sector should be retained as an independent specialist sector outside the mental health system. Um, from a mental health sector perspective, integrating alcohol and drugs into it would solve many of its problems. If mental health is your frame of reference, it makes perfect sense to do that. It immediately increases mental health capability to respond to alcohol and drug problems with um, really relatively little change. But I really think that we need to start thinking about alcohol and drugs and mental health as two independent specialist sectors with different needs, different philosophies, models of care, treatment approaches. They're all quite different. So just as a, a bit of an example, um, there are a small group of people that overlap, the comor but the comorbidities um, in each uh, of the different sectors are actually quite different from each other. So mental health um, as a, a sector focuses nearly exclusively on people who with low prevalence disorders like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, um, some suicidal uh, thinking. So if you kind of look through the square window into mental health, you see um, the people in treatment with a low prevalence disorder plus a wide range of alcohol and drug use, um, about 30% of whom will have some moderate to high level of severity of use that probably needs addressing or management. If you look through a different window, look through the round window into the alcohol and drug sector, you see about 90% of clients with mostly high prevalence mental health disorders. So they're things like anxiety, depression, eating disorders, personality disorders. And those mental health issues are usually addressed in primary care or the private sector. So with a psychologist, for example, not in the, not in the public mental health sector. So if you pull alcohol and drugs into mental health, if that's what's meant by integration, um, it's much more helpful for mental health than it is for alcohol and drugs. Um, so rather than integration, I think what we need is to improve the capability to respond holistically within both sectors, because the problems we need to respond to are quite different. It's just, for me, it's just too blunt and a bit unnuanced to say comorbidity equals integration. And I think the Royal Commission did recognise that in its recommendations, to give it credit. The alcohol and drug sector um, already largely operates in the way that the Royal Commission is suggesting that the mental health system needs to move towards. So away from that illness diagnosis kind of model to a more holistic model of care that focuses on a range of well-being indicators as success. So if we, for example, if we look at the medical workforce in the alcohol and drug sector, Pat um, noted that it's very small. There's about 150 addiction medicine specialists um, right across Australia. And um, 
they come from a really wide range of medical fields. So not just psychiatry. Addiction psychiatry is only a small subset of addiction medicine. There are also the bulk of the um, medical uh, specialists are um, physicians like gastroenterologists and cardiologists and emergency medicine. Um, there's pediatricians, uh, child and adolescent specialists and public health specialists and general practitioners. Um, so because drug treatment isn't just about drugs, and there's a whole range of other kind of physical and social impacts um, that Nico was uh, talking about. So there's no doubt, uh, I think, that the mental health sector is underfunded, um, but the alcohol and drug sector is even more underfunded. So in terms of episodes of care, um, both sectors service about the same percentage of the population. It's about 2%. But mental health is funded at 10 times that of the alcohol and drug sector. So they have 10 times the funding. So if you think mental health is struggling to fulfill its role, just imagine how much alcohol and drugs will be struggling to fulfill its role. And what often happens is that um, when we talk about integration, what the decision makers hear is mushing the two services together, which essentially means subsuming alcohol and drugs into mental health. And um, a lot of funding shifts from mental health, from alcohol and drugs into mental health. And that is part of the reason why um, the alcohol and drug sector is kind of uh, underfunded, so underfunded and limping along as um, Pat indicated. And I feel like one of the really key reasons is because that alcohol and drugs is sometimes less of a priority because of the stigma, particularly around illicit drugs, but also to some extent, the legal drugs. And, it's much greater in the alcohol and drug sector than it is in the mental health sector um, because of the illegality of drugs. And there's kind of this attitude among um, the community and some professionals that somehow people have brought their problems on themselves and therefore they don't deserve help. Um, but we, we don't say that about, um, for example, someone who was careless in driving or didn't wear, wear their seatbelt and got injured in a car accident or who has heart disease or diabetes because of their exercise and lifestyle choices. It's really specific to alcohol and drugs. Um, and some of the stigma is because practitioners get a bit frustrated or a bit despondent about the effectiveness of alcohol and drug treatment because it is a chronic relapsing condition, as we say. Mm. But we do know that drug treatment does work. The relapse rates are about the same as for other chronic problems like heart disease, diabetes, those kinds of things. We can always improve for sure. We've made huge leaps um, since, for example, in the 1930s, the AA self-help movement was a huge improvement on what came before it. And we've shifted even further now between like the 1960s and 1980s. We um, made significant improvements in psychological therapy for things like motivational interviewing and cognitive behaviour therapy. Um, and we've managed to do that without losing the holistic approach or getting over-medicalised in the alcohol and drug sector. So um, lots of random thoughts, but I think the upshot is that we should absolutely care and we should care very deeply and the community should also care um, because we know that for every dollar we spend on drug treatment, we save seven in other costs to the community. So even if it's not for compassionate or caring reasons, which it should be, um, there's absolutely an economic and social argument to fund drug treatment properly for a well-functioning society. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Nicole. Well, uh, I think we've got the, the ground fairly clear about uh, where the issues lie and, and uh, where, where perhaps the overlap is um, greater than I had understood it to be, at least. Now, I think we've got now... Uh, ample time for questions. I see that Patrick's just uh, reminded everybody that we're going to be ready for questions pretty soon. What what I think I'll do before we get to them, and there'll be many, so let's maximise the time we have for them. Uh, I'll quickly ask uh, uh, either Patrick or Nico whether they wish to say anything more now, having heard the three of you. Uh, do you wish to say anything, uh, Patrick, uh, not necessarily directly in response to Nico and Nicole, but it could be? And Who, then, um, are you uh, to Nico, do you wish to say a response to what Nico, Nicole has said? Hey, so, hey, over to you Professor first. Over to you next, Patrick, please. Oh, there's just confusion with all the Patricks here. <laughs> yeah, there is a bit. There is, there are, we are, yeah, we're very, 
handsomely endowed with Patrick's, so no doubt about it. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't but, mind that. Look, I, 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 agree, I, I agree with a lot of what Nicole and Nika were, were saying, but I would say that the way they're characterizing the mental health system, they're characterizing the mental health system the way it, it was and, 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 um, and, and the reason the Royal Commission was set up, because it's absolutely broken, absolutely broken. And, 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 and uh, the atrogenic and all the things that, um, um, that uh, Nico was describing, uh, the, the traumas and, and so on. And, and I, I would like to, I, I would hope that we would imagine a more holistic system that could actually have streams of care that could do both. In fact, Nico described uh, an integrated system with both happening in, in, in the, in the, in the um, injecting room sort of model. So, so, and we've definitely got that in Headspace. So, and I would say, Mental illness isn't just the three percent the state governments are responsible for. It's 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 it goes from primary care right through to tertiary care, and we see the overlap of, of substance use all the way through. And I I, I, I strongly disagree with Nicole to say that then that they're, they're different kinds of problems. There there are very similar kinds of problems, uh, um, in, in and the risk factors and the the um, the kind of treatments and and even the, even the approaches. Um, Overlap a lot, so I, I, I'm in fundamental disagreement there. I'm afraid I can see why culturally they've gr they've grown up in the way that they have, and I, I think the best guide to what we should do would be to ask the people that experience the, experience these these problems and, and ask them what they want. And Nico touched on that. Probably when you get to stage four of the condition, like what he's talking about, it is a different group. But we see people in the early stages, in the middle stages, well before they get to that point, and it's a very different ball game then. They don't know about all of our little t different turf wars within within the, within the sector. They actually just want help, and they, they they have to be provided, I think, in holistic, you know, integrated care systems. And, and they might be different depending on the clientele, but in governance terms, it doesn't make any sense to create different empires that don't actually work work well together. So I haven't changed my view, but I can see why you think the way you do because you're looking at the way it's been. But let's try to imagine the way it could be. Okay, uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, Nico, any comment at this point on? Uh, yeah, maybe just on briefly to say, uh, look, I think we have got perhaps a once in a lifetime opportunity to really improve uh, mental health and substance use treatment systems. And we've had, uh, that's been spurred on by this Royal Commission and the commitment of our state government to, to uh, to respond to that Royal Commission and, and uh, implement all the recommendations. As Nicole said, what we haven't had is an analysis of how best to meet the needs of our substance use patients. And I think um, one thing that would really, uh, you know, if we're going to spend all this money responding to the Royal Commission, we should presumably uh, ask, our, you know, as Pat's saying, let's ask our clients what they want. Let's look at what's the opportunity to do this to take this opportunity and maximize the benefits both for our mental health patients and for our substance use patients and for some some things that might be a fully integrated system for some things that might not there might be characteristics of each of the systems that we think um, are better the way they are but it's certainly uh, you know almost certainly look at some some collective clinical governance and avoiding the fragmentation of the system that we have at the moment but let's let's ask ourselves, you know, beyond the narrow scope of the Royal Commission, what is the best way to imp to collectively improve both both these systems for the for the good of everybody who's in them? Okay, <clears throat> because people want to improve their lives, I assume, is really the the starting point for those that you all see and work with. Mm. All, all right. Well, look, I think that's uh, that's. Uh, the point at which we should go to questions now. There will be, a, there are some. I just saw a couple of hands go up. So let's go to, to questions from uh, whoever has them uh, in the, in the large group of participants that we have in this. Uh, I think um, Jill, Jill has her hand up. Uh, Ian. Right, I didn't see that, Jill. Hi, um, thanks Hi. for uh, organising this, um, Patrick. It's really interesting and been fascinating so far. Um, I guess I, I wanted to ask about this question of different cultures of care. And I've certainly um, been in, in different environments. I've been in more AOD focused environments and now currently in a much more mental health focused environment. And I've also been in a substance use focused research group that sits within a broader department of psychiatry. 
um, and so seen it from a, a from different national perspectives as well, having been in the states and then having been in Australia. One of the things I think um, I find difficult is the idea that the cultures of care that the cultures of care being different themselves should be a reason why we don't consider more integrating integration of the system, because. From, for me, I really think that we have to think about what it is that's given rise to these different cultures of care. And so even if we, um, in the mental health system at the moment, which is where I'm um, both doing my research and also doing clinical work, we see um, a lot of people with substance use and a lot of people with substance use disorders. And so those people are still gonna be showing up um, regardless of um, whether or not there's an integration or, or not. And the culture of care in mental health, frankly, needs to change with regards to substance use. And so the question I have is why, why isn't that more of a reason for a more integrated approach? The differences really flourish in siloed environments. And so to me, you know, if we're not actually working on the same team, if we view each other just from an organizational psychology perspective, if we view each other as a different service rather than part of a multidisciplinary team, then those kinds of differences really become, um, become entrenched. And so for me, it's actually a reason for a more integrated approach. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, any response to on that, Nicole? Yeah, I, I, um, I can see that perspective, but um, when you think about kind of pushing to merging two organisations or two kind of sectors together, um, from an organisational psychology point of view, um, cultural differences are the number one reason why mergers fail. And so it's not an insignificant issue um, when you're trying to push to um, quite different ways of working together. And it's not just about the different um, perspectives or the different types of treatment. There's really fundamental um, attitudinal differences um, between the two sectors. So I think these are, these are really important things to think about. I think there's a... Um, I mean, I have uh, we've, I've done research where we've asked people what they want in terms of um, comorbidity, integrated care, and they do all say that we want a one-stop shop. I would too. I want to be able to get all my needs met in one place. The question is, um, how do we get that? How do we get all our needs met in one place? And it doesn't necessarily mean pushing the two sectors together. It's possible to improve. It's possible to improve the capacity of the mental health sector to better respond to the alcohol to alcohol and drug needs, without subsuming alcohol and drugs into it. And I think that's probably the key difference um, that uh, that I see. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, um, thanks, Nicole. Now, let's see. We've got some other questions. Do we have any? In um, it's yeah. Simon. Um, yes, in Simon. Firstly, I, I might just, in a, I, I want to put Catherine Wetton on notice because uh, from the department, now having had the opportunity, Catherine, to, to listen to our speakers, we might um, ask you for a comment or two. But from a government perspective, um, one of the big issues that always troubles a government is when you've got a very broad sector. So let's assume our sector is bigger than just mental health or just addiction, but we bring them together. And there is you know, significant difference within this big sector as to what to do. For obvious reasons, that can present a difficulty to, um, to government. Now, I've been listening carefully or observing the chat line carefully as to what we have in common though. And uh, Nico said a little while ago, it's really important to ask our clients, the people we're helping, what works for them, what they want, and Patrick, uh, Patrick McGorry was, I think, pretty quick on his keyboard to say, I agree, I agree. Mm -hmm. So perhaps then my, my first question is to um, Nico and Patrick, perhaps, you know, what do we mean actually by asking our clients? It's a very easy thing, Nico, for you to say, let's ask our clients. But um, what do we really have in mind um, as far as getting that input? And, and can I just broaden the question? I presume when we say clients, we presume um, the clients and all those around them would take a serious interest in them because it's a bigger ecosystem than just those who are, who are struggling with the addiction day to day out. Nico, would you like to go first? Yes. 
Um, you go first, Nico. Okay, oh, go, 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 you go. So for us, asking our clients it, uh, is a um, uh, a um, it, it's something we do we do through a kind of face to face process, but on, but on uh, based on uh, relationships that people have with them. It, they, when in in terms of asking marginalized groups what they want, you. You can't, it's, hard, it's hard to do a kind of uh, scientific kind of phone survey or something. You need to you need to really get people together in in a way that they feel that they that they uh, that you build on the trust that you have. And and we've we've done that from time to time. We did we did it again recently, um, uh, uh, you know, and again got some really valuable feedback, not just on the services, but you know you know perhaps for the what it could be like for the people living in Richmond area who might be affected by the drug scene there. So. You know, that's one element of it. We, we also do it regularly. We survey our clients. We regularly ask them what they think of the services they're receiving. Um, you know, and uh, this, so the, you know, it's, there are ways you can, you, you can do it. It's, I think you also need to keep in mind the people that you're not able to capture and how you capture their views. And there are kind of various ways of, of doing that. And then so at that one end of the spectrum, you've got that really hands-on way. And then, then that kind of that for that kind of the high prevalence disorders, there are kind of other ways which you can kind of capture what you know what you know what people's preferences are. Um, so, um, uh, in, in sorry, and getting back to the question is like, what was it? How do, how do we capture what what people want, and what do we have to think about? And 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 similarly, we can capture what family wants. And 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 uh, in our experience, that people it it. It's not typically surprising. They want a one-stop shop generally because they, uh, our clients generally do. But they, they, but they really want to be treated respectfully. Is the the thing that they say is, uh, time and again that they, they they want to be, they want to they want to, they want they come to the inject room because it's a safe space for them, uh, safe in from the overdose perspective, but also it's an emotionally safe space for them. Where they don't have to feel like they've got their kind of psychological guard up the whole time, yeah. and that's really important for them. Yeah. And um, and, and uh, you know, so and that's that's the that's the feedback that they that they give us time and again. And uh, you know, they haven't always felt like that in other parts of the healthcare system, and it's not just the mental healthcare system. We, you know, we have often. We've had you know, interesting experiences with staff who've come from other elements. Often they come from emergency because they think that's a, a skill sector that's kind of could relate to our work. And, and some of our staff have said, you know, I didn't think I had a kind of stigmatized view to this population and until I came here and then I realized I was in fact stigmatizing them and judging the population. And I, you know, and, and I'd been doing that for years without realizing it. And that, that you know, working in, in that environment had changed that. So, you know, I think that's just an anecdote that of uh, what our clients have told us. It was something, it's a great okay, question. Yes, Patrick. It's a great question, uh, Ian, sorry. Um, and and um, I agree with everything that um, Nico just said. I mean, we, we built that into to, to Headspace right from the beginning and we have it at Origin that, it's not just asking what they want. It's actually involving them in in the in the design and operation and the evolution of the service, you know, in a really genuine way. And that's why the services have worked because they actually. That's why they've mushroomed and scaled up across the whole country because of exactly that fact. It's it's, it's consumer driven reform. Um, and I make the a point that hasn't come across yet is that there's different groups of people to ask as well. Like obviously. What, what Nico and, and Nicole are sort of saying is that for some subgroups of people with, with addictions, and I would say the staging idea is very important here. You know, in the early stages and, and, the, and the preventive possibilities at the front end, which is what we see in youth mental health, it's a different ball game from, from end stage, you know, stage four conditions, you know, and, 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 and then it's a very different set of needs. And of course, the services have to reflect the different needs according to the stage of the illness and, 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 the, um, and, and, and the problem. So, so there are different subgroups. You know, it's not a one size fits all um, uh, and it's, it's more complex. But, but the principles and the, the things that people want, like respect and, and a welcoming environment and, and trust and compassion, but also they want expertise. And what I see that they don't get very uh, anywhere near to the extent that they need it, both in mental health and addictions, is enough expertise. And, and uh, I made the comment before about the, 
kind of failure of our, of our medical health and medical research system to support one of the biggest areas of burden of disease, which I think was mentioned earlier on too. You know, we, we're absolutely failing to support something that's a massive public health problem because of the way the NHMRC and the, and the, and the MRFF is uh, set up. The MRFF has spent 2.6% of its, of its funding, which is billions um, allocated on, on mental health research including addictions. And, and I think Nicole was saying it's even worse for addictions, which it probably is. So, so affirmative action is needed if we're going to um, do better here. Um, it, it, we've been absolutely discriminated against. So the stigma that's visited on, on the people that experience these problems affects people like us too, the professionals working in these spaces. Yeah. In, um, um, yes. If we looked at the chat mm. live, we'll say that Catherine couldn't quite hang on long enough to she took a good a, a good uh, opportunity to leave at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> she was a diplomatic call. But um, perhaps Catherine can be followed up. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we've got time for another question or two. We do. Or a comment. Any more hands up anywhere? Yes. We have, uh, yes. Um, Barb Kelly, I think. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I really want to thank our presenters today. It was um, a, a terrific um, presentation by all three, and I've been nodding my head all the other way um, as the <laughs> as I have um, listened to the issues. And, uh, any, and, of course, I have, for those who know me, I've had long experience in A&D. And, uh, and also across some mental health. The point that um, I wanted to raise, and it's a little bit left field, but it's actually critical for our client management um, and response to clients is the workforce. And one of the things about the workforce, which is not working at all at the moment, is the infrastructure to support uh, their endeavours to relate uh, and respond to the client who walks in as an, and hopefully getting a feel of a, a one-stop shop because you hope that all the work is actually happening behind the scenes so that it all feels quite seamless to the client whilst in the, or patient, whilst in the meantime, we've got database systems, we've got shared med medical record, we've got access to that expertise which may lie in mental health, in A&D, and in trauma-based services and so on and so forth. That's that's what I think. If we're if we're going to rebuild and reform um, from someone who's been managing services right across the board, um, when you don't have a apart from actual critical numbers of skilled workforce, you certainly must have the right um, infrastructure to support those that you do have in existence. And I've just put that out there as a comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now. Uh... I know Sam's got his hand up. I just need to find Sam Biondo on the screen. Hi, Hi Ian. Good to Hi. see you. Hi, yeah. Sam. Nice to see you. Um, the, I've got two issues. One is uh, really touches on what uh, Barb just raised, the infrastructure question. It's really, really critically important. And the, the workforce needs to be built up to actually address what we need to do over the next 10 years. Uh, I don't, I don't hear, and I don't see any conversation around what sort of forecasting there is around workforce. Maybe it's there. Maybe someone's focusing on this. I don't know. Um, if without it, um, building empty structures to put people in is going to be really problematic because all you end up doing there is probably dilapidating some of the other uh, systems that exist around the place as we pinch uh, and cannibalise workforces in other in other areas and other sectors bring them in to try and make mental health work. Uh, the other is, well, there, there is an issue, and, it, and I don't know who told me this once, but someone said to me once, uh, alcohol and drug sector was born out of the failures of mental health. And really, we need to, we need to fix this. Um, it's a problem because the community does suffer it. Uh, and there are, there are many, many differences um, in the different workforces and the approaches, but there is a need to build uh, the capacity of, of the individuals at work, both in mental health and AOD, uh, to meet the client demand. And, I, you know, and that's where the conversation is. This is where we need to go and, and, and converse on things. And the last point is, 
fixing people's lives up without taking care of their social determinants and uh, just merely patching them up, fixing up their brain and sending them back to the, to the, to the environments they came from is really, really problematic. It's just a revolving door. And if we don't start working on the psychosocial needs, we won't get anywhere. And just think of the prison system and what we do there. The tens of thousands of people that are coming through the prison system, the 200,000 people that have been on waiting lists, going through the courts, you know, and just in the AOD space alone, there's about something like about 10 to 12,000 people that come in every year in our space, occupying uh, space. It's very, very harmful. We create, or our society creates the, the conditions that create this mental health condition. We're doing it currently with alcohol, we are doing it with the latest liquor, liquor control um, uh, legislation bills before parliament at the moment. It's creating the next generation of problems. If we don't act smart and go I think, is it upstream or downstream to at the initial, initial point, they end up coming into our, our systems that can't cope with this mass of people. So we need to start having these sorts of uh, advocacy arguments as well. Thank you, Sam. I, I, I'm about to hand back to Simon to uh, wrap it up. Uh, but before I do, I think Patrick, you had a couple of comments. So Patrick McGorry on the, on that point that Sam was making. Oh yeah, I just put it in the chat, but I agree with yeah. Sam. I, I, um, we've got a massive problem with workforce. It, we, we've got a hundred vacancies at Origin, um, as a, you know, and that's before the Royal Commission really starts to hit, um, to get going. And that's in mental health alone. And, and, uh, and so workforce is a massive, massive issue, which I talked to Catherine a lot about in recent weeks. And those plane loads of professionals, they shouldn't be coming out to, to relieve the COVID system. They should be coming out to relieve the mental health and drug and alcohol systems, because that's where the, the, the post-COVID shadow pandemic is, is actually going to be, or already is, actually. We've got 1,000 people on our waiting list at Origin in, in the headspaces we run, 1,000 young people in our acute uh, youth access team waiting lists and 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 uh, uh, and, uh, and and about 900 um, of, of them are actually in the headspace. So we 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 can't we can't respond because of workforce now. So workforce. I'm so glad Sam brought that up. And and of course you've got to address a holistic range of needs. You can't help people with a mental health or addiction problem if they've got nowhere to live. You know, you've got it's housing first. It's it's all of those other sorts of issues. And in a preventive sense, of course, you've got to tackle trauma and, and uh, all those preventive opportunities that we have. But this has been so massively neglected, this system. That's why we have got Royal Commissions happening. Uh, and uh, we're starting off on such a low base, you know, that, that we've really got a huge job in front of us. Yeah. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, any other final comment to Nicole or Nico uh, before we go uh, back to Simon? Nicole, any uh, I just, observations um, you'd like to make? Yeah, just to make a comment about the workforce. I absolutely agree that this is the critical issue. Um, the both in both sectors across the health sector, um, it is the workforce that is the key to um, good practice to um, successful outcomes. The the issue for from the alcohol and drug sector, as as I said, is um, funded it at one tenth of the mental health sector. So mental health are having trouble with workforce. The alcohol and drug workforce has 10 times the problems because we just don't have enough funds to um, employ enough people or the right people. Or if we just have a look at, um, for example, in the mental health sector, there's about, I think there's something like three and a half thousand psychiatrists. In alcohol and drugs, there's about 150 addiction medicine specialists. And in mental, in the mental public mental health sector, there is about um, more than 20,000 psychologists and more than 20,000 nurses. In the alcohol and drug sector, you would find a handful of psychologists um, doing psychology work. So there's a there's a really huge implication for the workforce in the funding disparity um, in in alcohol and drugs. And I think we're not going to be able to address that until that funding's addressed. Thanks, Nicole. And uh, uh, Nico, fin finally, over to you for any last comment, if you want to make one. Nico? You're on mute. Um, yeah, on the workforce issue, yeah. I think we've got uh, 
kind of uh, less uh, about 20 addiction medicine physicians in Victoria and many of whom are kind of aging or not working part-time and we kind of I think the one of the findings of the Royal Commission in fact was we need kind of to multiply this by more than five I think in the near future to kind of cope with the anticipated demand so there's really uh, a huge need there look I, I would just say look I think that we, I think we've all been in agreement that, that we can provide a much better response to people with um, uh, substance use issues uh, throughout the, the, the course of their illness or their course of, and, um, and that, that you know one of the ways in designing that system would be to, to kind of seek the, the views of the people who have affected both the, the people with the substance use disorders and their community. And uh, I would just emphasize once again, perhaps there's an opportunity to, to think before we commit the, a once in a lifetime uh, amount of money into our mental health treatment system to think how can we do this in a, in a way that will best be most effective for those people, both with mental health uh, conditions and substance use conditions, given that there is such an overlap between them. Yeah. Mm. All right. I see that on this uh, on this topic, there's a there's a uh, a uh, comment from Stella. She says the current draft EBA for mental health nurses addresses the Royal Commission's workforce recommendations. It remains to be seen if something like if if the something like 800 newly funded positions can in fact be filled. So that's a comment from Stella, who's a mental health nurse. Now, uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, I'm going to hand back now to Simon. Thank you, Ian, and I'll be very brief as we've uh, just turned 6.30. But uh, look, on behalf of everyone who's been on this, um, this, this Zoom forum, um, I want to start by thanking our panellists for explaining, uh, certainly in a way I never understood, um, the differences um, in your opinions. Well, that has been very clear to me, and I, I thank each of you. But I thank each of you also, actually, for the views that you've shared where you agree, whether it's the importance of consulting with the people that we're all trying to assist and their families and close friends, as well as, of course, where we just finished up a few minutes ago on the uh, on the absolute dire state of the workforce. I, I had no idea the absolute numbers that are required. Um, that was, um, you know, we've talked about epidemic far too much in the last year or two, but the, the need to deal with this epidemic and the workforce that's simply required um, in some respect, and I want to get this point out right, that there may be differences between people we've heard tonight and the various particular passions they have for the areas that they're involved in. But my gosh, if we don't have the people to actually roll up the sleeves and do it day in, day out, therein lies a massive problem. Um, can I thank Ian? Um, thank you for moderating tonight. Your decadal uh, long background in so many different areas uh, is just the perfect um, host tonight. So thank you so much for moderating. Uh, to, uh, to Patrick M, to, um, to Nico and Nicole, thank you for your perspectives. Um, in particular, I want to thank, uh, Patrick's actually just sent us a note, don't thank me again, but Patrick L, I have to thank you. Uh, it was your initiative. Fabulously supported by Nelly. Um, you know, these damn Zoom things are not easy, especially bringing a whole bunch of people together who don't work constantly day in, day out. Um, Nelly, thank you. Um, it's been absolutely brilliant all the way along, including the, the, the change from the physical to the, to the virtual. And, um, and uh, you know, thanks for everyone's interaction. And in particular, I've been asked to... Um, uh, to, to say to everyone, just stay tuned. It's not going to be the last thing that um, uh, First Step does in relation to trying to make this very broad sector as efficient, as effective, as helpful as it can to the many, many, many people who rely upon it. So um, thank you all and um, have a good evening wherever you are. Get your umbrellas out. It's going to rain soon. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for the evening.